Oh, my name is Carolyn Hayes. I'm the Director of Children and Young Families at Gaithersburg Presbyterian Church, and welcome to Bible Study. We began this Bible study last January, and um, we began at the beginning with the idea that we'd go through right through to the end. We took a little break um, to do a Lenten study and then uh, yeah, COVID got in the way, but as soon as we could, we got started again. And um, today we find ourselves at the finishing up second Kings. It, we're going to be ver, uh, chapter 17, verse more or less 15 through the end, through the 25th chapter. Uh, we'll pray and then we'll get going. Gracious and loving Lord, please open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears, and open our eyes to you and to your word. Help us to see you at work in our world each and every day, and help us to understand how to put the lessons that we're learning from these stories that happened so long ago into our context into our world um, and to see you working in all of them. Help us to see you in the people that we meet each and every day. Help us to see you in all of the people. Help us to be active peacemakers and justice seekers. Give us strength and perseverance, but most of all, give us love, understanding, and compassion so that while we are doing those things, we are doing them in the ways that you would have us do. Please bless this study and us to thy service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, long story short, um, we finished up last week with the Assyrian king having pretty well cleared out um, Samaria, uh, the Israel, the Northern Kingdom. Um, he has exiled all of the people and resettled them in some of the areas uh, in Assyria. Assyria is now, it's, this is at the beginning of them being the real power of the area. Um, so they have, they have plenty of area to resettle. And they're taking, they take the Israelites out and put them in the Assyrian outlying areas and take the people that were in those outlying areas and bring them into, um, into Samaria to resettle that area. Um, they also bring a couple of, um, or at least one, um, Israelite priest back to the area to teach the uh, people that are resettling the area how to worship the God of this land, because remember, they thought that God belonged to an area. Um, because apparently lions kept carrying off the settlers. Um, the Israelite priest was more or less successful. He did teach them about the Lord, and he did teach them how to, how to worship the Lord which they did after their own fashion. They did um, with their own people in their own way and alongside their own gods. So, and apparently they did right up through, you know, for quite a while. Let's just leave it there for quite a while. Um, so in the meantime, back down in Judah, Ahaz, you may remember, was a real stinker. Um, he did not walk in the ways of the Lord and died. When he did, his son Hezekiah ascended the throne. Um, and as happened on a fairly regular basis in Judah, um, Hezekiah walked in the ways of the Lord. He became king in the fourth year of the reign of Hosea, the last king in Israel. In the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, the king of Assyria attacked all of the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Hezekiah paid the king of Assyria 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold to go away. He did. But as often happens when you um, 
bribe someone, uh, they came back for more and threatening violence. Um, Hezekiah sent a messenger to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah assured them that uh, those were mere underlings of the king of Assyria and that God would not let them overtake Judea. Meanwhile, the king of Assyria had also sent word to Hezekiah telling him to just give up. The Assyrian army, he assured them, would overtake them just as they had done pretty much everybody in the Mediterranean, you know, which they had done. They were, as I said, they were the ascending power in the area. Hezekiah, interestingly, and really unheard of since the time of David, took this message to the temple and read the message to God, asking for deliverance. Isaiah sent word to Hezekiah, telling him that God had given Isaiah a message, which essentially said that the Assyrian king would not, in fact, be entering Jerusalem, and that God would defend the city for God's own sake, as well as for the sake of his servant, David. And that night, an angel of the Lord killed 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers as they slept, which gave the king of Assyria pause and caused him to withdraw to Nineveh. That king of Assyria was later killed by two of his own sons, who then escaped to the land of Ararat, and a third son succeeded him. Now, somewhere along the line, Hezekiah became quite ill. Isaiah came to tell him that um, he had received word from the Lord that Hezekiah was going to die. Um, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed really, really hard. God heard his prayer. So before Isaiah had had even a chance to leave the palace, the Lord spoke to Isaiah. Isaiah turned around, went back into the palace, and told Hezekiah that the Lord had given him 15 more years. Um, that the Lord would indeed send the people of Judah and Jerusalem into exile, but it wouldn't be during his reign. It wouldn't be on his watch. Isaiah told the palace physicians to make a poultice of figs and to apply it to the boil that apparently he had, and he recovered. Hezekiah went on to do a lot of really great things for Jerusalem and apparently lived out his 15 years. When he died, however, um, his son, Manasseh succeeded him. Manasseh was not a man of God, and he did such evil in the eyes of the Lord that it was evidently pretty remarkable. In the 25 years of his reign, he did as much evil as his father had done good. He rebuilt the high places and did apparently just all man manner of detestable things. The Lord, speaking through his prophets, said, and this is really kind of scary, he said he would bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judea that the people who heard about it, his ears would ring. Um, Ammon, Manasseh's son, succeeded him, and he too did evil in the eyes of the Lord. But he was so awful that his... Uh, officials conspired against him and killed him. His son, Josiah, succeeded him. Take a deep breath. Just everybody take a deep breath. This is one of those pauses where in Judea, when Judah, things are good for a little while. Second Kings 25. Never before nor after Josiah was there a king like him, him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his strength in accordance with the law of Moses. Now, Josiah, in the 18th year of his reign, 
was in the process of rebuilding the temple in the proper way. Remember, in a couple of good kings ago, they were doing it, but they were, it seemed like there was a lot of skimming going on, um, but he was doing it in the proper way. And while they were in the process of rebuilding the temple, they came across the book of the law, which had been lost for years and years and years. Well, upon reading it, Josiah was, he was so distraught. He was so upset. He was, he was heart sick at how far they had strayed from what God wanted them to do, but they didn't have the book of the law. They didn't know. Um, and over the course of, and this has been years and years and years um, that they had not really been following all of God's laws and, um, and commands. So, Josiah sent some of his priests and officials to a prophetess named Huldah. Huldah essentially said that, yes, indeed, God would bring disaster on Jerusalem and Judah, but, he, but God would not do that until after Josiah had died. Josiah did one of those things that, again, was like at the back when the people of God were still in the desert, he read the book of law, the book of the covenant to all of the people of Judea. He called all the priests and all of the men of the area and he read it to them. And he said, this is what we're gonna do. And then he set about genuinely and truly doing what they should have done years and years and years and years and years before when they first got into the promised land he cleared out all the high places he destroyed the asherah poles he he did it he really really did it he renewed the covenant with god and the israelite people he set about system systematically removing or destroying all that was left over the pagan stuff all the vestiges of baal and all of the other gods of greater Canaan. He started with all the stuff in Judah, and then he went up to Israel and kept going up there. Um, and though he did right in the eyes of the Lord, the Lord still said that he would remove Judah as he had removed Israel. Now, um, so Josiah is working through his 31 years of his reign and doing an, a lot, a lot, a lot of good. In the meantime, the king of Egypt and Assyria, Assyria is this ascending powerhouse and, you know, Egypt, even on the decline, Egypt is still Egypt, have joined forces and they attacked Judah. Josiah rode out to meet them and he was killed. Jo Josiah's son, Jehoahaz, succeeded him and reigned for three months. Reigning through for three months is the clue that he probably was a stinker too. He was. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The king imprisoned Jehoahaz and imposed a very stiff tax on Judah um, and made Eliakim, Josiah's other son, king. Jehoahaz died in Egypt. The Egyptian king changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was 25 when he, became, when he became king during his reign. Enter Nebuchadnezzar. Um, during his reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land. Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Um, and for those of you who are unaware or unfamiliar with that word, it basically means he paid him a lot of tribute to not attack and kill everybody. Um, he became his vassal for three years, uh, but then he changed his mind and rebelled. Then the Lord sent 
not just Babylon, not just Aramea, and not just the Moabites, but those three plus the Ammonite raiders against him. The Lord sent them to destroy Judah, and they did. Jehoiakim died, and his son Jehoiachin succeeded him. Jehoiachin reigned for three months, three months being the kicker. Um, no surprise, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Quote, at that time, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem, took all of the royal family captive, along with all of the other officers and fighting men, all of the craftsmen and artisans, a total of 10,000 people, leaving only the poorest of the poor. Nebuchadnezzar made Zedekiah king in Judah. Zedekiah also did evil in the eyes of the Lord and rebelled against the Babylonians. <sighs> Jerusalem was then kept under siege for two years. The people were starving. The city wall was broken down and Zedekiah and his sons fled. They were overtaken. The sons were killed before Zedekiah's own eyes and then his eyes were, quote, put out. He was then taken to Babylon as prisoner. One of the commanders of the Babylonian army then set fire to the temple and truly finished off Jerusalem and carried off the remaining people. The Babylonians did leave a few of the poorest of the poor to keep the vineyards and the fields. So Judah was essentially in captivity and exile. The Babylonian king put a man in charge of those who were left. This man had a non-resistance approach to the Babylonians, which some of his fellow We'll just call them left behinds, took issue with. They killed him and ran away. And, <clears throat> quote, at this, all of the people from the least to the greatest, together with the army officers, fled to Egypt for fear of the Babylonians. So there is apparently no person of Israelite descent left in the promised land. You've got people in well, Assyria, Babylonia, you got people all over the place, but they're not there, they're gone. Interestingly enough, the very last verse in the 22nd, 25th chapter of 2 Kings talks about Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, who had been in prison in Babylon, was released from prison in the 32nd year of his exile. He lived out, this is so weird, he lived out the rest of his days receiving an allowance from the king of Babylon and being given a seat of honor at, at the table every evening. He ate with the king of Babylon every evening. And thus ends Second Kings. Um, it's an amazing story. Um, and we will start First Chronicles next week. And then we get through First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, which is still all history and stuff. And then we get into the, the um, we start getting into the prophets. Um, so take good care. I hope you and your families are well and safe and taking care of each other. Um, wear your mask, stay in your bubble, and I hope to see you in person soon. <laughs>